I'm so happy to see you, like to see you. So for live stream people, for YouTube people, you guys, we have YouTube people. How weird is that? We were a living room group moments ago, it feels like. Um, I, we were just talking about it beforehand, and we think maybe there's about 50 ladies in real life here. 40, 40, 50, something like that. I'm a terrible estimator, but we are saving your seats for you. Live stream people, uh, people in your basements ripping out carpets right now because they reek so badly of mildew. We're saving your seats for you next time. We've gone through a, a little calamity here in Abbotsford, British Columbia, haven't we? Um, my husband told me that we are on CNN, Routers news source. I don't know what that is, but apparently it's a big news source. Um, I have a little darling living in Germany. Um, it's my son's fiance, and she's sending us European news stories about little Abbotsford, British Columbia, that are making their way over um, across the real pond um, to her neck of the woods. So we're here. The 50 or so of us are here, and we're saving your spot for when you deal with your flooded basements, or your evacuated homes, or your beloved animals who you are so afraid for their well-being these last few days. We're waiting for, for you. We're keeping your spot safe. And we look forward to the day when you can come back and be with us in person. Um, all right, can I have slide number one up, please? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> This was one of my favorite lessons I have studied in so, so long. I felt this week studying about this man, Stephen, the way I remember feeling studying that Old Testament man, Caleb. Remember Caleb? Stephen is that cool. St Stephen is Caleb level cool. And uh, so our main emphasis together this morning is going to be not, not Stephen's life per but digging into the last moments of Stephen's life. Remember that scene in your homework? Remember that episode? We're going to uh, zoom in on his heavenly vision in Acts chapter 7, primarily verses 54 through 60. I found it to be just gobsmacking. And for those of you who are interested, I'm making it a personal goal in the new year to stop using the word gobsmacking so often. <laughs> I know it's irritating. I get it. I'm going to expand my horizons. I'm going to get a thesaurus or something for your listening ears' um, sake, and I'm going, to, I'm going to try and think of some different words. Uh, today, we are going to walk through four things together. I don't have a slide to this effect because I don't want to make them anymore because I never make it all the way through my points. Um, but the goal is we're going to walk through don't look around you, look up, emulate Jesus, and never mind the rest. That's the goal. Don't look around you, look up, emulate Jesus Christ, and never mind the rest. Okay? So before doing our deep dive into the momentous vision and the close of Stephen's earthly life, um, let's talk first about what you notice about Stephen, the man. He's kind of special, isn't he? I need you uh, in-person ladies to help me out here. I need you to yell it out bravely, and I need you to do it loudly. And tell me, what kind of a man was Stephen? What are some attributes that you read about this week? What was he like? Bold. Full of a spirit. Wise. Wise. He did, signs and he did signs and wonders. Did you notice that he was the first non apostle to do that? What else did you notice about Stephen? Full of grace and power. Full of grace and power. What else? Yeah, well-known, good reputation, full of, the wisdom, full of wisdom, full of the spirit by which he spoke. What, the, the coolest thing of all, which I still don't understand what it means, the face of an angel. The face of an angel. What does that mean? I want to know. So lots of full of language, full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, full of this, full of that. In Scripture... 
when we read things like to be full of something, it means to be controlled by. This is a man controlled by the Holy Spirit. He is the first one, as I mentioned, documented for us in Scripture outside of the 12 apostles, privileged to get to do signs and wonders. I love so much how Stephen isn't wasting time here coveting other people's kingdom gifts. He's not mad and sulking in a corner that he doesn't get to be an apostle. He just gets to it. He plays his role. He does it beautifully. He fans those very pronounced gifts into flame, and God uses him. So, do you use your kingdom gifts for his glory? And you know what I notice about you guys? You never sit dead center with me. These are the ones that I make eye contact with the most, so you always leave feeling rebuked, right? <laughs> Are you using your kingdom gifts for his glory? <laughs> this is for all of us. This is for the live streamers. This is for me. Are we using our kingdom gifts for his glory? It's not just for Hallie and Mary Jane. When a guy shines this brightly with the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, people notice, don't they? Some people seem to like it. Others gnash their teeth. What does that mean? We're not a gnashing of our teeth sort of a people here in Western Canada, are we? Have you ever seen a YouTube video of a Middle Eastern riot? They are more of this ilk. They are more of this teeth gnashing sort. I think this biblical description makes more sense to our Western ears when with our own eyes you watch on YouTube or elsewhere the Palestinians hating on the Israelis. It makes more sense when you see things like that. These biblical listeners do not feel neutral about Stephen and the things that he says, do they? Did you notice any other emotional language here in this passage? The listeners were emotional listeners. We read, they cried out with a loud voice, and they stopped their ears, and they rushed together at him. We don't really do that here in 2021 Canada, do we? Can you placid Canadians even picture such a thing? I learned an incredibly cool thing um, from a commentary by Warren Wearsby this week. Evidently, there are two different words for crown in the New Testament. Diadema, which means a royal crown, and it gives us, of course, the English word diadem. So we have diadema, and then we also have Stephanus. Stephanus, which means the victor's crown, which gives us the popular name Stephen. Stephanus. You can inherit a diadema, but the only way to get a Stephanus is to earn it. I don't know about you, but that gives me chills down my spine to think about the victor's crown. Acts 6 and 7 center around the life and ministry of Stephen, a spirit-filled believer who was crowned by the Lord. Listen to what Revelation 2 verse 10 says. I had to read it in the Old English, too, because it has such gravitas. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Isn't that incredible? We are watching that scene in Acts 6 and 7 as we watch Stephen and his earthly life. This man is victorious in the end in no uncertain terms, and I so long to be like him with his Stephanus. May I please read Acts chapter 7, verses 54 to 60 for us, please. Could we have slide number two up, please, ladies? And I'm going to ask you guys in person to do something different with me. Would you put your books aside on the empty chair beside you, and would would you take a minute to stand up with me? I want us to copy one of the coolest saints ever to exist in Christendom, the late R.C. Sproul. And this is what they did in their church when they read the Holy Scriptures. They always, always stood. Thank you. 
You guys are such good sports. <clears throat> Starting in verse 54. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and they rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. You can sit down now, girls. Thank you. Point number one, don't look around you. Do you notice the vibrant chaos swirling around this man in this scene? Wouldn't the natural thing to have been for St Stephen to fixate on the angry crowd around him? They're yelling, they're shaking their fists. Wouldn't it be normal for him to focus on the ominous removal of the many garments? Why are you taking your cloaks off? This doesn't bode well for me. Would we think less of a man under these circumstances if he stood stock still, paralyzed by fear? It would perhaps be less dignified if he yelled back at them, trying desperately in a last-minute attempt to change their minds and save his hide. And yet, this would be quite understandable, don't you think? If I had a mob ready to kill me, so furious that they were advancing and gnashing their teeth at me, I'm not sure I'd be able to take my eyes off of them, except for maybe to quickly and furtively look around me to find an escape route. So here's my question for you. What is your proverbial angry mob around you this week? I think it's not super likely that there's anybody clamoring for your actual lifeblood, but think about it with me for a second. What are the circumstances in your life that tempt you to be distracted, that perhaps tempt you to be afraid. I know that there is more than one flooded basement represented in our midst today. I know that there is more than one evacuated home. Our little town looks an awful lot like a scene from a dystopian novel this week, doesn't it? Or, let's just get a lot more uh, mundane about it, sorry. Maybe what you're tempted to sit and stare at isn't so much an angry, teeth-gnashing mob, but something much more ordinary. What small busyness has crept into your life to lull you into forgetting the titanic, monumental things about human existence? Does shopping, like a sleeping pill, make you forget the pressing nature of naming his name to the slowly surely dying neighbors in your life? What is your sleeping pill? Carpooling? Kids' sports? Home decor? Too much food? Controlling the lives of your loved ones? I'm looking into my own heart a lot here now. As I thought about it this week, my mind ran to the scene in Genesis 15 where God restates his covenantal promise to Abraham. Do you remember what it was, the covenantal promise? God told Abram that he would make of him a great nation and that he would bless him and make his name great so that Abraham himself would become a blessing. And incredibly, God went so far as to say that he would bless those who blessed Abraham and that he would curse those who dishonored Abram. He took it so far as to say that in Abram, 
all the families of the earth would be blessed. Quite something, right? You'd never, ever forget a promise like that from the almighty king of the universe, would you? But listen to this. Genesis 15, verses 1 to 4, our scene opens us up to find a fearful man, a very fearful man. This is what it says. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. So after restating his gracious promise to Abraham, which in and of itself is very gracious, don't you think? Let's move on to note what God does next. Verse 5. And God brought him outside. God said to Abram, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. And of course, we know we can't. And then God said to Abram, so shall your offspring be. And Abram believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Another version phrases it like this. God took him outside and said, look at the sky. Abraham was in his tent when the word of the Lord came to him. I think it is moving that God escorted Abraham outside the limited parameters of his man-made tent to expand his vision. Sometimes I think we stare too long at the cramped walls of our own understanding, and we need our exquisitely kind and patient God to escort us outside where we can see the wide open sky and be challenged to think bigger. Is it possible, my dear sister, that your vision is too limited because your, your faith has been too indoors of late, so to speak. So my point is this. Sometimes it's a mob trying to kill you, and sometimes it's the stifling walls of a very ordinary tent, and they are both exceedingly effective in getting our eyes off of our Lord Jesus. I love Isaiah 26, 3 on this point. Do you guys know that one? Oh, I think I said that wrong. Oh, no, Isaiah 26, 3. This is the coolest verse ever. You know that neighbor that I love that you've been praying for for me? You remember we talked about her a few weeks ago? She made me a sign with Isaiah 26, 3 on it in beautiful calligraphy. So I, I think about her often when I think of this verse. This is what it says. I'll feminize it for us today if it's okay for me to take such a liberty. You keep her in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because she trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. This is the answer. This is our answer. The answer is always to stay our mind on him. That's interesting language. Stay our mind on him. It makes me think of fix your eyes on Jesus. It doesn't say casually give a quick glance to. It doesn't say even occasionally focus on for a time. Stay your mind. Fix your eyes. That's when the peace comes. Staring at the wall of your little tent rarely leads to transcendent flourishing. Don't gape at the angry mob, but also don't stare mindlessly at your tent wall. So instead, what we do is we move along to point number two, and we look up, just like Stephen did. My family and I rent a junky little cabin every summer. And this year, I noticed a little change to the decor there. I'm so glad I took a photo of it because surely the Lord meant for you to get to see it too. 
It's up right now. Somebody did a little beautiful, um, is that called needlepoint or embroidery? Needlepoint? Anyway, somebody made that glorious little thing, and I just had to take a picture of it. Isn't that perfect for us this week? So this week, I looked up references in Scripture to lifting one's eyes. And girls, there are so many. This can be no coincidence. There must be something hugely significant to this last act of Stephen's. He looks up to heaven, and he sees who? He sees Jesus. And isn't it interesting that Jesus is standing, not sitting? In Hebrews, we learned how he's he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. Here we see him standing, almost as though in welcome. He faithfully witnesses to what he sees. Right to this livid crowd, he faithfully witnesses nonetheless. So never let anyone tell you that a Bible concordance can't be tremendous fun. Remember Psalm 121? It's a pretty famous one. It starts out with telling us, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. I think there's something about hills and mountains, perhaps, that inclines one's thoughts to the Lord. Do you ever wonder why the ancient pagans always worshipped at high places? I love thinking, too, about how Jerusalem is perched up on a mountaintop. This week, I was privileged to get up high, quite physically. And in this case, lifting my eyes up forced me to get my focus up off of my ignorant self. I saw a scene with my own eyes that melted my previously oblivious heart, and it allowed some real compassion to soak into me. I don't have any social media, and I don't have any way to watch news and things like that that I can understand. I'm sure my kids could show me, but to my limited knowledge, I don't know how to turn on our TV. Um, so what I did is I got up on some high land. I got, got up high with a friend, and it helped me to fuel and better shape my love for my neighbor. Could we see the next slide, number five? Oh, sorry, I think that's the wrong one. I probably said, there we go. That's the one I want us to look at right now. This is what I saw this week from a mountaintop. That is the Lower Mainland. Heavy emphasis on the word lower. That is a lake currently. And I'm actually really excited because I've got a date with a friend for tomorrow to go up again, and I'm really interested to see how it has changed. You see, I live up on the highest ground in all of Abbotsford. So I had my tea, I was sitting in front of my fireplace, I was mostly ignorant until people from Germany started sending me videos from my own town about what was going on down there. It was so good for me to lift my eyes, quite literally. And I learned this week that there are all sorts of benefits to lifting our eyes. In Scripture, in Zechariah 5 to be uh, specific, we get to spy on an angel telling Zechariah to lift his eyes so that he is able to see a heavenly vision. And it made me wonder, maybe we're able to see things sometimes that we wouldn't otherwise be permitted to when we lift up our eyes. Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, is chock-a-block full of lifting up your eyes language. Listen to this from chapter 51. This is God talking. My righteousness draws near. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. Take stock of the true state of things, I think is a modern way of saying it. For the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. Sorry, you guys. I'm doing this very badly this week, aren't I? Listen to me, you who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear not the reproach of men, nor be dismayed at their revilings. Lift up your eyes. Or, 
Do you remember the story of Jesus walking on water? It appears in three of the four Gospels, but only in Matthew, something's going on here, only in Matthew do we also learn that Peter also walked on the water. I'm going to read a little portion of that scene for you. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Where do you suppose Peter's eyes were in that moment? He said, Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came up to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, and where is his gaze fixed now? He was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is Matthew 14, verses 28 to 33. So how crazy would this have been to witness? Ever since Peter began to sink, Peter has had people who criticized him in this moment. But have you ever seen any of Peter's critics replicate his move? Can you even imagine the moment of slinging your leg over the edge of that boat and putting your full human weight onto the surface of what you knew your whole life could never support you? Can you imagine the faith of this man? I'm never going to criticize Peter again for this moment. When we watch him walking on water in response to Jesus walking on water, there is so much for us to learn. I think it's when I shake my head. I find Peter so endearing. I just love the way he wants to emulate Jesus. So a storm is surrounding him right now, right? And even despite this fact, what does Peter do? He looks to Jesus. And I think the principle is clear for us. Especially when life is a tumultuous storm, look for Jesus and keep looking to Jesus. So what is your own personal storm this week? We have a lot of really dramatic storms going on. We've talked about those already. But we have some mundane storms going on also. More ordinary storms. Some of you contend with rebellious children. Some of you are quietly living with a marriage that is just slowly fading into the background of your life. You don't know what to do about it. There are as many storms, I think, as there are sets of ears listening right now. So what does looking to Jesus look like for you this week? What should looking to Jesus look for you this week? I think if we stare too long at the storm, pretty soon it's all we are able to see. So I personally meditated on this question at some length this week. How do I fix my eyes on Jesus? Remember from Hebrews? Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. How can I fix my eyes on him? I learned something about two years ago that has totally blessed my socks off. And I want to teach it to you, too, so it can bless your socks off. It is such a tangible way of fixing my, my eyes on Jesus each day. I learned it from a really wise Bible study teacher, and her name is Dee Breston. And I've actually only done one of her Bible studies, but I loved it. I would recommend it as a corner filler for Christmas or summer. And it's called The Jesus Who Surprises. Um, in, in the Bible study that I just referenced, she talks about instituting a habit into her home life years ago that while in the moment seemed like a small thing, reaped huge consequences in the life of her family. And she created something called a daily God hunt. She and her family would gather around the dinner table in the evenings, and on a whiteboard that they kept specially there for this exact purpose, they would record all the ways in which the family members had spied God that day. Sometimes it was a piece of his handiwork. Sometimes a child would walk into the dining room with a little leaf that he or she had found out in the yard, and it was evidence of God's hand. Sometimes um, it was one of God's kind yeses in answer to prayer that somebody reported back. 
But every single day, the family made it mandatory that they had at least one I Spy God moment that they could record together. Um, she said that they ended up growing deeply in faith together. So maybe you're like me. Maybe your heart's default is to be so egocentric that you pray all your prayers. You pray, you pray, you pray, you pray, and then you forget to watch for his kind yeses. It doesn't make for a life full of thankfulness, does it? So every day now, since November 2019, when I learned this from Dee Breston, I've recorded my daily God hunt moment in a journal that I keep to this end. And I delight now in reading through my old entries. And then I see all the countless ways the Lord blesses me each day. And do you know what, you guys? It's made me into a dramatically more thankful woman, a dramatically more watchful woman. And it's mandatory. And some days, in the early days, if you decide to copy this great idea, it's going to be tough slugging. Some days, I would just have to go outside and get a branch from a tree and put it in a vase on my Bible study table and look at the branch. And you know what? I can't even think of a better I Spy God moment than sitting and staring at a branch from a tree. It's really, really wonderful. So when Jesus commands you, you obey him, right? Back to our scene on the water. Jesus told Peter to come to him. And even though it made no earthly sense for Peter to obey such an injunction, he did what his Lord Jesus told him to do. And this is what obedience looks like, doing what he says, even in the face of the fact that it makes no earthly sense sometimes. So I wonder, is there an area in your life where you are not obeying the Lord? Or is there something for which you've only partially obeyed the Lord and then deceptively comforted yourself in that partial obedience, saying, well, at least I've moved forward a little bit, right? I heard somebody wise once say that delayed obedience is really just disobedience. Let me say that again. Delayed obedience is really just disobedience. I'm sorry, Tammy, that I keep looking at you. I don't mean to. <laughs> it's an accident. So faith is simply taking the next step. Peter took one step to get out of the boat and onto the water, and Peter was doing just fine when he was focused on the next step. He got into trouble when he lost sight of his rabbi. So what next step does Jesus ask you to take? An excellent and diverting way to fix your eyes on him is to studiously train your eyes away sometimes from your own storm and onto the storm of another. A sad thing to witness is a Christian sister so caught up in her own storm that she becomes oblivious to the stormy pain of others around her in her life. And as I thought further about it this week, I realized that there are so many ways to look up in one's life. Sometimes it's just a literal looking up. Um, so next slide, please, number four. So when your child yells at you to hurry up and come outside to look at the rainbow or the sunset, joyfully, not grudgingly, put your tea down, hoist your tired, aging body up off that couch, and go with them to look. This is what I was privileged to see a few nights ago when my kid yelled at me to, Mom, come outside and look. There's nothing like a November sunset, right? Lucy Maud Montgomery in Anne of Green Gables says this about November. It's one of my favorite quotes of all time. It was November, the month of crimson sunsets, parting birds, deep, sad hymns of the sea, Passionate wind songs in the pines. Anne roamed through the pineland alleys in the park, and as she said, or sorry, as she did, she let that great sweeping wind blow the fogs out of her soul. Do you get outside enough? Do you take enough photos of these November sunsets? They're not going to be here for another year, you know, so go fill up your camera roll while you've got the chance and let that great sweeping wind blow the fogs out of your soul. 
It's a looking up. A consistent highlight in my personal week is my Monday morning forest time. I can't say that I'm always overjoyed to strap on my rain gear, but I have never once regretted going outside to be alone with our God in his creation. Never once. Loud, beautiful worship music is a necessary component of this looking up for me. What about you? What reminds you to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith? Maybe about five years ago, for the first time, I began to feel the winter blahs set in. I used to be like my children. I was utterly oblivious to the weather. I had a grandma, a dearly beloved grandma in my past. Her name was Grandma Dixie, and she and I used to be pen pals when I moved away from our tiny town to the nearest big city to go to school for university. And I remember reading her letters and feeling utterly befuddled by her obsession with the weather. Especially bad weather. We were Albertans, mind, so we had bad weather to contend with. But now, as I come closer and closer to my 50s, I get it. I understand. I've become that person. I'm obsessed with the weather app. So three years ago, as I felt these blahs begin to settle into my soul, I decided that I just needed to hike all winter long, regardless of the weather. And I wasn't going to let the forecast determine my day's activities any longer. And you know what? It helped me dramatically. I've never once regretted a rain hike with a good friend. I leave her companionship soaked but edified. We ask each other questions like these. What is God teaching you these days? Where are you personally disappointed with your sanctification of late? My heart is warmed even while my fingers are freezing. Rain hikes with saints is a way for me to get out of my tent, so to speak, to look up and to number the stars. We watch for mushrooms now. That is just beyond geeky, I know, but we do mushroom hunting. The most gracious ones of my friends feign enthusiasm with me as I point out the different varieties I've never seen before. Mushroom hunting has become a way of looking up for me. For another friend, bird watching has become her joyful new way of looking up. Can you believe he lets me be friends with somebody who is a bird watcher? What is she, like, straight from an Agatha Christie novel, or what? I love it. Maybe the very most important effect of a good looking up is that as we do it, we see our vast, transcendent God better. I love thinking of God saying to Abram, come outside with me. Look at the sky. Remember the stars if you can. And, of course, we all know he can't. I have an 18-year-old son, who is currently obsessed with space and the colossal scale of it all. He's been doing a lot of research lately on quarks and quasars, planets and galaxies. It was so adorable. If you can call something coming out of an 18-year-old boy's mouth adorable, which I think you can. He said to me the other day, Mom, sometimes I have to just force myself to stop thinking about it. I don't know how you get anything done all day when you know Saturn is out there. Saturn's rings are out there looming. And you know what? I think this young man makes an excellent point, don't you? Maybe the best thing for us when our troubles and cares feel overwhelming is to number the stars, to remember that this great, competent God of ours breathed, he breathed, Stevenson 218 out into existence. Have you heard of Stevenson 218? In the very coolest confluence of factors, I am privileged to teach you about Stevenson 218 on the very week we study its biblical namesake, Stephen, the deacon and the martyr, in a single week. You may not have an 18-year-old son to teach you about such things, so let me help you out. Stevenson 218 is the largest star we know of to date. Which means nothing, really, as our knowledge and command of the universe is puny, to put it mildly. We call our grasp of it the known universe, 
because there's far out there, far more out there, sorry, that we do not know than that which we do. So Stephen, sorry, Stephenson 218 is a red supergiant, and our finite minds simply cannot grasp the scale of the size of that thing. And what's more, it resides, so to speak, in a cluster of 25 other red supergiants. And our God used his voice to create them. I have a quote to read to you today. The author is not a Christian. His name is Bill Bryson. It's a book called A Short History of Nearly Everything. Bill Bryson here is talking about the size and the scale of what we know today about the universe. He says, such are the distances of our universe that it isn't possible in any practical terms to draw the solar system to scale. Even if you added lots of fold-out pages to your textbooks or used a really long sheet of poster paper, you wouldn't come close. On a diagram of the solar system to scale, with Earth reduced to about the diameter of a pea, Jupiter would be over a thousand feet away, and Pluto would be a mile and a half distant, and about the size of a bacterium, so you'd never be able to see it anyway. On the same scale, Proxima Centauri, which is our largest star, would be almost 10,000 miles away from the pea that is Earth. And even if you shrank down everything so that Jupiter was as small as a period at the end of this sentence, and Pluto was no bigger than a molecule, Pluto would still be over 35 feet away. So the solar system is really quite enormous, Bill Bryson says. By the time we reach Pluto, we have come so far that the sun, our dear, warm, skin-tanning, life-giving sun, has shrunk to the size of a pinhead. It is little more than a bright star, and in such a lonely void, you can begin to understand how even the most significant objects, Pluto's moon, for example, have escaped attention. And in this respect, Pluto has hardly been alone. Until the Voyager expeditions, Neptune was thought to have two moons. Voyager found six more. Bill Bryson says, when I was a boy, the solar system was thought to contain 30 moons. The total now is at least 90 about a third of which have been found in the last 10 years. So the point to remember, he says, is that when considering the universe at large, we don't actually even know what is in our own solar system. That's just the Milky Way. That is gobsmacking. <laughs> So when we feast our eyes long and hard on him, we are rightfully situated in the light of him. He is big, and we are not. He is God, and we are not. No one ever said that we were, or that such grandiose things were expected from us. We can and we should just go sit at his capable, safe, sheltering presence. He says things in scripture for his children. He says things like, I am your rock, I am your shelter, I am your fortress, I am your ever-present help in time of need. He doesn't say, go hew out some stone for a shelter for yourself. He doesn't say, work hard, faster, faster, and build your own shelter, you small, stupid one. He does not say, God helps those who help themselves which is a demonic teaching if I have ever heard one. Go regularly to the one whom the floodwaters obey, the one who speaks mountains out into existence. Point number three, we should emulate him. Of course you noticed this week the striking similarities between Stephen's last words and the last words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Stephen acts in the end like a man who knew Jesus' words by heart. It's like Jesus' words had sunk so deeply into him that in this last greatest moment of crisis in Stephen's life, Jesus' words are what pour out of him. You have to study him 
in order to be able to emulate him. And we talk very frequently around here at Priest Up Thursdays how lies about our Lord Jesus Christ circulate everywhere, even inside the church and Christian subculture. Someone in Christian leadership in one of my children's lives recently told her that only God the Father experienced wrath. Jesus never did. I think the person's intentions were good. I think perhaps the person was just maybe a little bit biblically ignorant. But I think what was going on there is maybe they were wanting to try to slot Jesus into the good guy category. It's rather presumptuous, and I was so grateful for the fact that my child vaguely recollected Revelation 6, verses 16 and 17. She didn't remember the reference, but she knew vaguely that she had read somewhere where it describes still rebellious people in the great tribulation at the end, cowering in caves and under rocks, calling to the mountains and rocks, saying this, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him, who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? These things really matter, because our God's character is true, outside of us, outside of our understanding of his character, outside of our vapory opinions of what we think is nice or not. It is not for us to distort him to the world in an effort, well-intentioned or otherwise, to make him a bit more palatable to our own sensibilities or to the ears of our listeners. How can we love him unless we know him? We can copy him best when we know him well. So how does one typically get to know a friend? We spend time together purpose to do that more intentionally this week with me. What if we, in all quietness this week, asked him to correct us all, individually, on a point at which we believe something wrong or untrue about him? I know I believe something wrong or untrue about him. I just don't know what it is yet. Let's ask him that. Let's ask him to correct us where we're wrong and especially from keeping us from teaching or perpetuating these false things about him. I don't want to believe untrue things about him, and I know you don't either. Point number four, we need to never mind the rest. And strangely, I actually think this one is really easy. If we diligently exert ourselves to do points number one, two, and three, then point number four, I think, will quite fluidly just fall into place. When one's eyes are still a bit dazzled from looking at Stevenson 2.18, our jaws maybe even a bit agape, I think we're less likely to notice the mosquito buzzing near our ear or to be more inclined to gloss over the stink of the kitty litter that your teenager promised he would scoop and then immediately forgot. I think we are quick and quicker to give grace to our yet sinful husband when we just spent an hour thanking the Lord for his kind grace to forgive us our sins. This one is pretty easy. I love that line from the song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. This is what it says. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So let's all be women for who the things of earth grow strangely dim as we contemplate our Lord more and more. God does not call all of us to be martyrs like this wonderful, faithful man named Stephen that we get to study and spy on this week, but he does call all of us to be living sacrifices. Romans 12, 12 elaborates. In some ways, maybe At times, it's harder to live for Christ than to die for him. But if we were living for him, practicing the small daily dyings, dying to self, dying to the flesh, dying to my sin, maybe we will be all the better prepared to die for him in the end, if that's what he calls us to do. We'll be better better readied for these grand moments if we're faithfully being strengthened in the small ones and the medium ones between today and today and maybe that day. So don't get distracted by the angry crowds. 
Don't be stupefied into forgetting by the bland walls of your little tent. Look up, emulate your Lord Jesus, and never mind the rest. Let me pray for us. Father, the more I learn, the less I realize I know. And strangely, you have brought tremendous comfort to me through that knowledge. I love thinking of how big you are, how utterly capable, how vast, and how transcendent. I pray this year, as we study the book of Acts and the book of Philippians, that you would allow us to know you more and more, better and better, so that we are more comforted by the fact that we get to stand on the rock that is higher than I, the rock that is higher than we. You are the king, you are mighty, you are holy, you are awesome in your power. With our own eyes, we have seen displays of this this week. We praise you, we trust you. You're the king. No one ever said the king was safe, but there is no question that the king is good. We pray that you'd let us know you more, king. We only ask such a bold, audacious, crazy thing because we know we are allowed to through what our Lord Jesus did in procuring us access to your throne room. We love you. Please spend our lives to share your glory, to spread your fame. Please continue to grant it to your servants, the women of Precept Thursdays, to boldly name your name and to preach your word. We love you. We trust you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.